I'm the project manager for the improvements and restoration of the Bay Village Neighborhood Park for Boston Parks and Recreation. And um, I'm gonna take us through the introduction and then hand it over. But first I wanna start by thanking you all for your time and insights. Um, you know, we can bring our professional expertise to the issues and our knowledge of what Boston Parks can successfully maintain. But you all in the neighborhood know the, um, know the park and how it's used better than we do. So we're very grateful to you for giving us part of your evening. Um, next slide, please. So I should get some business out of the way. And that is that um, the department's going to be recording the meeting and posting it to our project webpage so that those who can't attend or wanna be reminded about um, what was said can go to that. It'll take a few days to get that up on the web page, um, but it's really useful to have it there. It's also possible that other participants um, might be recording the meeting with their phones or cameras or other devices. And if you don't wanna be recorded during the meeting, um, you can keep your microphone and camera turned off. Next, Aaron. thanks. So during the Q&A, in order to participate, if you're joining by phone, use star nine to raise your hand to ask for audio or video permission to ask questions or provide comments. And then via the web, you can use the chat feature to ask questions or make comments. And um, you can raise your hand to ask for audio and video permission again for comments or um, questions. Next. So I'll, I'll introduce the team and then we'll, um, I'll hand that over to our design consultants, Copley Wolf Design Group, and they'll take us through the um, presentation. And then we'll have a time for community feedback um, where you can give us your ideas and we'll listen and respond if we think that that will be helpful and then closing remarks and next steps. Next. So as I said, I'm Annie Blair. We also have Christine Brandeo, who's the outreach coordinator within the Parks Department, um, helping to facilitate tonight. And we have two, um, representatives from Copley Wolf Design Group. One is Jim Haru and one is um, Aaron Kramer. And they're really doing the bulk of the work, which is fantastic. So next. And the schedule so far has been, um, we had our first community meeting and typically we have three. Um, and that was really about our listening to what you all had to say about what you see as the um, issues to be addressed and the goals for the park, and also what's sacred and should not be changed or altered. In between that, that meeting and the second meeting, we also had a drop-in session in the park um, at a point where that seemed safe to do that. Um, and we're gonna to look tonight at a series of four design alternatives and we'll get your feedback on that. The next community, community meeting is gonna be sometime in the fall. And I'm not exactly sure when that's going to be. And that's because the funding for this project um, was a $25,000 grant initially from the Edward English Salt Brown Fund. And that paid to get us design services through this point, the second meeting. We put in a request in um, the latest budget for significantly more money, 550,000 more to take us the rest of the way through design and construction documents and bidding. And then um, 
you know, most of that's going to go for construction costs. And because I haven't been able to write the contract extension yet for design services, because we don't have the finally approved um, <clears throat> budget yet, but we're, you know, like 99% sure we're going to get that additional 550,000. Um, I can get prepared to getting the um, contract out the door to go through a series of steps within different departments in the city. Um, so that means that we, we may have a bit of a hiatus between this meeting and the final meeting where we'll show a preferred design. And that preferred design could be um, sort of a blending of different features that we're gonna look at tonight. We don't, don't have to choose all of one alternative or um, we can say, okay, we like this and this and this from various alternatives and um, put those together. And then we'll have construction, construction documentation through the um, winter and then spring construction start through the summer. And then hopefully we'll be reopening the park in September of 2022. And I think that with that, um, Jim, I'll turn it over to you. I'm going to let um, Aaron begin mm -hmm. to introduce um, what we've heard, but I did want to add to what Annie said too, in that um, the Brown Fund not only uh, paid for our design services, but uh, that included within that number, in that fee, same fee number, was a full survey of the property, which uh, is instrumental in having us understand the scale of the park, you know, the slopes of the park, and really the technical parameters for which to work within, um, which really helped us in the concept phase, but also will be you know, paramount for the moving forward too. So um, I just wanted to let you know that. Um, so with that, Aaron is a landscape architect um, who is was instrumental in putting this package together. So I'm gonna let him um, sort of bring up the, um, the, the main points and then I'll jump in later on with the concepts. Good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm going to start out by um, reviewing what, we, what we've heard up until this point, first, both at the first community meeting and at the on-site um, meeting. Key things that we heard and was that you really love the park and, we, and you want to preserve the character of the park you like how the park functions, you'd like to preserve the function of the park. The perennial gardens are beautiful and you would like to restore them. You'd also like to restore the materials of the park. So that's the existing lighting, the fencing, the paving, um, the edging and other materials. Um, the existing fountain is light and you'd like to restore and upgrade it. Um, electricity would like to be brought into the park for events, holiday tree lighting, music, and other community functions. Um, there was a desire for some additional storage for some of the maintenance items for all the planting and to provide some additional trash receptacles. Based on all the feedback, one of the goals that we have for this park is that we recognize that the planting is very important. And before we were to do any construction, we would work with you to inventory the plants in the park to figure out what you would like to keep, what, need, what are we preserving, what would need to be replaced and to make sure that anything that is damaged would be replaced in kind so that the garden character would remain. Um, here's some existing images um, of the site, as, as you know. Um, current fountain, um, it's calming, it's, it has flowers growing out the top, it's in okay shape, it's in pretty good shape. I know there's a desire to make it recirculating. Um, there's a seasonal garden tool storage currently at one of the entrance walls for the maintenance of the plants. The um, plantings are very beautiful here. Here's a couple, one example showing all the hydrangeas in full bloom. Um, there's some, some flexible seating that people brought into the park, some umbrellas with tables and movable chairs and some movable benches. There are two current raised planters at the park. Um, may need a little repair, um, but they're, they're there and they help kind of, they're at the existing gateways. 
the um, current view from Melrose looking towards the entrance has kind of a, if you look out the entrance, it kind of focuses on a parking garage and the Charles Gate um, is quite wide and uh, it kind of interrupts the, the lush planting on that end of the park. Um, here's current site plan, just for reference, again, pointing out the um, Charles Street entrance and the Melrose Street entrance. There's an existing drain where all the, for all the runoff in the park. There are three existing trees that will remain. Um, the perennial gardens, the existing fountain, and other features. The gas plants, which we are planning on keeping, and the three raised planters. Here's a site analysis take both taken from the existing site inventory images, site visits, what we heard, and the site survey. Um, you'll notice the two visual axes that are, so what do you see when you look out the gate? Um, the one on Melrose, as we saw in the before photo, it um, looks towards the parking garage. Um, and the one that goes across at um, Charles Street South, really, it looks kind of out into the distance. The two corners of the park, um, which you know are kind of focal points where you'd be drawn, like if you look at the corner, those as evidenced by those two red arrows, kind of there really is no anchor at either corner if you're looking out the park. And the three raised planters, and there's that um, walkway between the Boston Chinese Church of Saving Grace and the park that is currently um, fenced off and it's just kind of a small pass through space. Other positives of the area, um, as shown by the dark lines, there's a really strong community edge in, as you go towards Bay Village away from Charles Street. Nice building facades, nice brick. Um, it's very welcoming. There are narrow sidewalks and most of the sidewalks within Bay Village are brick with the exception again of Charles Street, which is concrete. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Jim. Yeah, I'm gonna jump in just um, I'll add a little bit. Can you actually go back one, Aaron, really quickly. Um, some of the things that, that we looked at, uh, certainly heard you that you like the park the way it is. You just you know, love its spatial features. You love the perennial gardens um, and it's just general function. Um, but some of the things that, um, that it, it lacks was a, a major focal point, which a lot of great parks have. Uh, and the focal point could be, um, you know, it could be a sculpture, it could be water, that sort of thing. So let's go forward again. And so in the neighborhood, these are all in the South End. So a very short walk from where you are. Um, the Bradford Street Park and Ringgold Park both have as a focal point um, a fountain. Uh, and basically in the backdrop. And if you've, been, you've probably been to these parks since if you go for a walk during, uh, uh, during this pandemic and just to get out of your house, you'll see that you know, there's a beautiful gate and you look in and you, you, it draws you into the park to a certain feature. Uh, whereas the Harriet Tubman Park and the Hay and Hayes Park, um, there's a sculpture that, that you fo focus on as you come into the park. And um, so, you know, these are focal points that it's, they celebrate, you know, uh, something that's part of, uh, of the region, uh, whether it's sculpture, or it's history, um, the strong materials, you know, they usually have granite and brick, you, know, you have brick um, in your park. Um, each one has a passive garden quality. If you've been to the parks, you, you see that there's lots of perennials, lots of uh, strong woody plants as well. Uh, each one has, like your neighborhood park, strong neighborhood involvement. I mean, people are out there weeding, they have uh, community events and that sort of thing. And a common denominator is, is that the Edward Ingensoll Brown Fund has um, donated toward the sculpture or toward the fountain or toward the gates. So it's, it's, uh, it's, you're in good company. And uh, I, I think if you are wondering, you know, how you know, these parks could influence yours and, and they influenced some of the concepts that we're gonna be showing you. I think that it's worth just a short walk into the South End to visit them. I'd be happy to go with you, by the way. I li I've lived in the South End for 37 years, so <laughs> I'm a neighbor as well. Um, uh, so let's go to the next slide. So the concept plans. 
go to the first one. So this is um, uh, basically a light touch on your park. Yeah, Construction is a messy business, but in regards to spatial and function act, um, of the park, this is pretty much what you have. And leaving the entrances on Melrose Street, leaving the entrance on um, South Charles Street, uh, leaving the general shape of the plaza itself, the park itself, um, it, it functions the same way. The, the, the big move would be upgrading the materials in regards to um, you know, the threshold. Currently, you have a brick threshold coming in from Melrose, a concrete threshold and steps coming in from uh, South Charles Street. And the fountain, if you, if you recall, is actually sort of tucked into the perennial garden um, along South Charles Street. So, you know, the, we pulled it out and made it kind of a focal point looking in from South Charles Street, um, just to try to bring it, make it a little bit more central and um, put granite around it so it could possibly have an interactive um, feature um, and of some sort. We are showing some, some permanent benches, um, which are general placeholders for the time being in this concept. And um, it's not going to discourage you from putting flexible, movable furniture out there as out there right now, because I know everyone loves that kind of flexibility, moving a ch chair into the shade and that kind of thing. But there'll be some permanent seeing out there right now uh, in the future. And, and whether there's three or four or five, you know, that will come through the design process. And you can see that, the, as, as um, Aaron mentioned, uh, the intent to keep the gas lighting. Um, if um, it would be dismantled in regards to re, uh, doing the surfacing of the brick pavers. And um, during the on-site meeting, people ask, why do they have to be changed? Um, currently, the park itself, even though it, it's accessible and that you can come into the park with a wheelchair for, off of Melrose Street, uh, the pitch of the park is not an accessible accepted pitch by ADA standards. Uh, it's currently over 3%, three and a half, four, 4 in some areas. And, and the acceptable ADA pitch is, a, is less than half that. It should be about one and a half to 2%. So, so in order to make it friendly for all people, it would need to be brought, um, brought up to those standards. Um, we do show a little storage box um, as you come into the park off to the left uh, of the raised planter. And it would be our goal that we would take those raised planters, knowing that they're falling apart in regards to the masonry right now. And um, we've been told the one on Melrose Street is a happy home for a bunch of rats right now too. <laughs> we would be um, dismantling them and rebuilding them. And we're suggesting that perhaps they're rebuilt into um, using, instead of brick, maybe use uh, cubic granite pieces just to um, make it easier for maintenance over the years. A brick falls apart rather quickly and then you have to repoint them. Most of us live in brick buildings and know what that's all about. And it's, it's, it's not a great thing to have. Um, but also, and then along the edge is perhaps build up um, the curb and with a stronger edge condition, as you would see if you went to visit the other parks. It's typically not a little meager curb. It's usually a, 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 a actually a design feature and an, a, an aesthetic move to really create a nice edge to the park, a nice edge to your perennial garden, and perhaps put a border in and that sort of thing as well. Um, at, in that analysis, plan. Um, Aaron mentioned the space that's visual space that's kind of leaking in the corners. So when you're in the park, it, there's a very nice enclosure uh, you feel by the buildings that are around the park, except along South, South Charles Street, where it's basically a, a busier, more commercial type street. And if when you're standing in the park, you can look toward the um, found hotel or toward uh, the Elliott Norton Park. And those corners seem to bleed into that commercial street. So well-placed, and it says small tree, you might think large shrub, small tree, um, basically a flowering feature plant that would help contain that space a little bit better. So it's all a series of small gestures and a, and a big move to create to upgrade the ADA aspect 
but it's, it's essentially your park today with a, with a more upgraded fountain and, and materials. Um, next one, concept two. Concept two is, is creating those focal points a little bit more and also making the entrances both ADA accessible, not required. Uh, it'd be nice by sliding the entrances from where they are now on Melrose and South Charles um, a little bit deeper into Bay Village along Melrose into the corner and a little bit to the left on South Charles toward the corner. Um, would allow the access into the park to be on a wider position. Um, basically, as you come out of the park, instead of coming out to the park onto um, a relatively busier road in South Charles or a narrow walk onto Melrose, um, the park, the entry onto Melrose uh, would actually be in a nice sort of generous on granite area, which would, could take in the entrance to the, um, the church, um, which we recognize hasn't been open for a while, but it could be, develop into something as well. So it's also pushing you into your community itself rather than pushing you onto Melrose Street. Uh, I forget who made the comment, but when we were out there on the on-site visit, someone asked, you know, can't we do something about Melrose Street? And then we look out that gate and we're looking at uh, you know, a very um, ugly street at the side of a parking garage. This would alleviate that. It also would allow us to um, have the entrance of the park be the focal point to uh, the fountain itself. So bringing that fountain out of, um, off out of the perennial edge and out into the park itself, you'd be able to look right at it. And, and that would just be a nice draw into the park itself. Um, in this, um, in this option, we actually, in matter of fact, the next three options, we actually remove the raised planters, which we, again, recognize they have to be rebuilt anyway. They're probably difficult to, to maintain and the planting is, is up too high. And they're a bit of a visual barrier as you come out of Bay Village into the park. Um, they're sort of a visual cork at, at the corners. And uh, it'd be nice actually to, um, to extend the perennial gardens. Um, much as the entrance on South Charles being moved does. So it, rather than having it be interrupted, it's a nice, much more longer uh, contiguous edge to the street and to the garden itself. Um, concept three. Concept three is a little bit more um, moving those entrances. It's actually relieving the pressure of the um, tightness coming out on to, coming out of Bay Village along Fayette Street. So you actually have a, a more generous entry to the park uh, and also keeping this the same move on Melrose Street. So now we have two focal points um, looking uh, one focal point and two positions for that focal point looking from Fayette and looking from Melrose. So really grabbing the true Bay Village community um, um, that's on the top of the page um, as you come to the park, looking right at that fountain. Um, each one um, would have a granite pad that's associated with the fountain itself and for, within some form of interactive feature, which we'll show you some examples of. Um, again, using those small flowering trees in the corners to help contain the, contain the space. Okay, let's go to concept four. And this is something that is a, kind of a drastic move, but something I think worth thinking about. Um, when Broadway used to come through this space, Broadway Street, um, there was a sidewalk along um, the, the church. And it became kind of an orphaned sidewalk when the park was created. So um, in a way, it's a bit of a wasted space when you think about it. You, you probably don't have a lot of foot traffic on it. And if we suddenly made that the main entry into the park with a secondary egress onto uh, South Charles Street, 
you can, in a way, kind of expend, extend the park. You could even put some flexible seat, seating in that space as well. So essentially, as you come out of um, the Bay Village community, you come along the church area and you have a large area, which could actually have tables and chairs in it. And you can come into the park where, again, the focal point is the fountain beyond. And, um, and then you're basically, in matter of fact, you could even use that, that um, walkway passageway as, as uh, an opportunity to set up like where the tree might go, which we didn't be begin to tell you where the tree could go. We, we will supply electricity, but, uh, but it's trying to give you as many opportunities as possible to say, well, you know, where do we want these features? You know, where will the stage go for music and, and that sort of thing? So it, it, it's, it's a little bit of a drastic move from the, what you have today but I think it's worth um, some thought and some consideration to see if there's any value in, in sort of rescuing the offerings um, sidewalk up against the church. And the next one is a summary of all four. And, and I think it's good looking at each one. So it's sort of progresso concept one, leaving the entrances where they are. Concept two, shifting them over a little bit. Concept three, shifting them to the corners to really embrace the whole um, Bay Village community as it comes out of the, the main body of the community and into the park and putting a softer edge contiguously along South Charles. And then concept four, uh, embracing the orphans walk along the, along the church. As you can see, the form of the park, the spatial quality of the park is very much the same. Um, it's just really the circulation through the park and, and creating those focal points. So why don't we talk a little bit about materials? Go to the next slide. And I'm gonna let Aaron take this um, from here on and I might jump in with a little bit of color as needed. Okay, so for any of the for any of the concepts, we would be looking at um, refreshing some of the materials of the park. Uh, for the for the main park um, paving, we would look at the bottom two images, which would be wire struck brick pavers. So they are brick. They're um, compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act, and they come in various colors. We can discuss colors like: Do you want a redder brick? Do you want a darker brick? How would you like to? How close? Like try to. Do we want to make it stand out a little bit or do we want to match visually all the surrounding sidewalks and buildings? Um, the accent paving that um, Jim was talking about in the concepts, this is just an example. We're, we're proposing granite. It's durable. It goes well with brick. It's easy to maintain. Um, it is also compliant. We could use that for borders around the edges or around the fountains. And then there are many different ways to lay brick. Let us know in the comments at the end of the presentation if there's a different pattern. Uh, right now it's a standard running bond, but there are different ways that you can run brick to really ex you know, make the space special. Um, site materials. So we're keeping the existing gas lamps, um, refurbishing them as needed and restoring them. The flexible seating, um, you will be bringing that in. Um, the community can bring in flexible seating. Boston Parks does not install flexible seating generally, but we will be providing um, benches fixed seating. We have three um, examples shown. These are all um, very standard benches. We could do them with black steel straps. You could do a classical steel frame with plastic or wooden slats. And then depending on the size of the bench, all these are shown without center armrest. We could add a center armrest depending on the length of the bench. Um, to for um, activities at night and also to help people get up and out of the bench if they're mobility impaired. Also showing a Boston standard um, trash receptacle. This is the kind of receptacle that you would be looking at adding into the park. Um, here's some of those fountain ideas that we were talking about. So the first picture is current fountain that we'd be restoring. And then how would we bring some interactive elements in? 
These are two existing fountains that you can go visit at nearby Ringle Park, the one on the left, which is a little bit bigger, and the one at Bradford Street Park, which is more of a smaller interactive element. For the site drain, the existing drain in the center, we'd be bringing that up as we bring up the path. And I think and that would be a good place where you could add a unique drain cover as another decorative element to the park. Um, currently, the edge of all the planting beds are cobbled. Um, the lower left image shows an example of where we could maybe bring in some beefier granite elements to both match the accent painting, paving and to really like delineate the edge of the bed in a nice, clean, visually pleasing manner. Um, storage was something that came up to, as something that might be desired. This picture is just showing a, a current example of a storage box from Ringgold Park, where you would be able to store tools and other plant maintenance items. Another thing, so if we do the granite edge at the, cur of, at the planters, uh, it's up for discussion, would you like a border guard in addition an ornamental iron border guard to match to go with the fence to help you know protect the plantings. And then we were talking about anchor trees. Here are three examples of trees that um, you, they have blooming at different times for some seasonality and they, they pr they're pretty open and they would just flower at different times. Do you want a mid-late summer bloom like a tree hydrangea? Would you like a red bud that blooms middle of spring? Or would you like something like a witch hazel, which is some of that first pop of color as the plants come alive? And then with that, we are opening it up to the community feedback. Um, some of the things that we'd like to hear, what, what events take place at Bay Village? How can we help connect the park to Bay Village? Which concept of the four do you prefer? Do you prefer a com combination of like, say you like the fountain, location from number two, but you'd like to keep the planters from number one, let us know. What is your favorite part that you would really like to keep? And are there any elements that we missed? And Jim, do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, in regards to uh, how can we, uh, the park be more connected to Bay Village, uh, that just so you know, that is the goal of the concepts is to, as we begin to look at the entrance, how you come into it, um, you know, sliding those entrances and relieving the pressure on the sidewalk, along with um, really bringing, you know, if you, if you know, matter of fact, I was telling Aaron the other day, um, if you go to Google and just type in Bay Village Park, Bay Village, not Bay Village Park, Bay Village, Boston, um, Google is very nice and it creates a little border for you as to where Bay Village is. It runs right through the middle of the park and it sort of goes off to, into the neighborhood and leaves out half the park and, and South Charles Street. That's actually, um, it, it, it's how I've always thought of Bay Village. It was like this park is on the edge and um, South Charles is really kind of more in a way theater district, Chinatown slash other things. And Bay Village is, is stepping across that threshold. So those entrances can connect where, as our attempt to really kind of connect it to the neighborhood, you know, that, um, defining that threshold a little bit more. So um, it, it is our goal to that, again, that the park feel like it's your park, that, that, that the changes made were subtle enough to have it feel as a continuity um, to the spatial usage yet simultaneously it's been, and it's, and it's restored to what you'd expect it to be, um, re rescuing every plant, having the garden um, aspect of it be exactly what you think it should be, um, but simultaneously having it um, improve enough in regards to its entrances that you feel like you're stepping out your door and you're stepping into the park. It's part of your house and part of your living room in a way. So that's, that, that's our goal. And that's how we looked at it as we developed these concepts. In regards to benches and things like that, that's all like um, furnishings that, that you know, can get kicked around and how the fountain functions. And that, that, that would be the, um, the, the next step in terms of us consolidating these concepts into the one you prefer the most. And, uh, and as the design, you know, we would come back with the design, the design that we felt you guys have told us you prefer us to have, not four versions of it. And then 
as Annie mentioned, there's money to move into the true design phase and, and the preparation of construction drawings and construction at that point, you know, we would say, you know, yeah, you can have a bench, but it can't be more than four feet wide, uh, long. Uh, you, uh, we, we'd love to have a fountain, but we don't want our kids to get wet. All those types of things. Uh, that's, that's the discussion. That's when that discussion would happen. So get the rocks out. <laughs> We'd love to hear from you. Feel free to raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Knock yourself out, Andrew. Aaron, if you want to read the chat off, can too a few comments and questions in chat. Sure, um, I can read a couple of them. Uh, first couple of comments from Judy. Um, she, she says concept number four concerns her, especially if the church ever gets sold. She likes number three's entrance at Fayette. She says it's interesting. It would be nice to have a crosswalk there between the garden and Elliot Norton. A lot of people cross there now without a crosswalk. Kendra says that she agrees with the above comment. It would be nice with the dog park there too. Andrew um, comments, the benches would permit homeless to sleep on them, even with center arms, total non-starter. Also, he, he believes that additional trees in the corners that we were proposing would block the police view of what's happening in the park. Overall, he prefers number three. Judy says she's wondering if a storage box is needed. There is a large one across the street. Um, Carol asked how the concept decision will be made. Um, I can yep. say that, mm -hmm. that will be based on the feedback we hear tonight. And then I believe feedback that Annie receives from people in the neighborhood. Annie, is that correct? That's right. Yeah, and Aaron, let me just uh, add a little color to the storage box. When, you know, we're not, we're not attempting to replace the storage across the street, which we understand is uh, where the furniture is stored for the winter, that kind of thing. I, I've actually met with Tom on, on site and asked a bit more about the function. The storage box, you know, and it, the size to be determined is really um, for your everyday tools. Like someone's coming out there, they, they need a spade, they need, they need a, some fertilizer or a bucket or something. Um, rather than walking across the street, um, that, that's what the storage box is for. That's why that um, rather small one shouldn't at Ringgold Park. That's to select the everyday little things that you don't want to run home to your basement to get. So just, just to make that clear. Okay. Um, I have two more. Um, hope I'm saying this name right, Aoife Austin. Um, she loves the options and it was interested in the third option, but she may need to try them out. Andrew says, oh, and then Andrew's asking to be unmuted at some point. And I saw somebody had their hand raised, Christine. Yeah, um, Andrew can speak and then I will allow Tom to. You might be muted, Andrew. He's unmuted. Huh. Andrew, so, so you know, we can't hear you. We can see your lips moving. <laughs> hmm. Tom, you can unmute yourself and, and then Andrew will come back to you. Sure, can you guys hear me? Sure can. Okay, I think Andrew's actually John Shope, if I'm interpreting this correctly. I think he's oh. <laughs> borrowing his partner's computer um, <laughs> uh, and probably trying to juggle with it. Um, thanks, guys. I really do appreciate it. I think that the effort here, I'm the president of BBNA. I think the effort here does reflect the feedback that you guys um, have heard. So I'm generally encouraged about this. Um, you know, I'm far from going to be the strongest uh, opinion or decision maker on this, although I'm very much intrigued by um, uh, option three, uh, just from personal standpoint. Um, I will disagree slightly with John on the topic of furniture, which I realize, you know, we'll have to address kind of down the road, but I do think we have enough elderly folks in the area and in the neighborhood and the 
you know, kind of the seasonal furniture is in fact seasonal and it would be nice to be able to sit down in the park um, in the off season when the seasonal furniture may not be able to be deployed. Um, and so I, you know, while I recognize the concern about having individuals camp out there overnight, and I know that people are frustrated by the fact that that's happening uh, right now in Elliot Norton, reality is that that's happening without furniture. And so I think it would be nice to at least have a bench in there. Um, although we might want to be careful about the design of that bench. Mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. thing I should add about the furniture is that a potential solution um, to wanting to avoid providing sleeping places is that um, we can do single chairs with armrests, you know, that are like two feet wide with occasional tables in between them. So you have a place to put your bag or your coffee. So we have, we have a number of, of options that we can look at. That might work out fine. And I do see your comment, John, and um, I know Isabella Park well, so um, I will take that into consideration. Thank you for that comment. Can I make a comment? I don't know if did I need to raise my hand and be called on. We can see you. Okay. And hear you. And, and hear you. All right. And hear well, you. <laughs> yeah, no. So I just want to say thank you. These are great options. I really appreciate having uh, professional eyes look at the park and make suggestions for improvements. And I like your comments about how you need to have a focal point and, ha and uh, having the fountain be more of a focal point. I think it's a great idea and uh, having the entrances more accessible. You know, I, I understand that. So I, I like what you've done there. Um, you know, having some anchors, I'm, I'm, I love trees, so I'm sorry. I love the perennial garden. Is there some way you could have some more trees and still have enough sun for the perennial garden? Um, I think that would be nice. I'm, you know, maybe it's the selection of the trees uh, that would af afford some visibility uh, so you can see what's going on in the park. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, so that's, and then the idea of having some seating, I mean, in the, Often now, I mean, the seating is taken away in the winter, so no one can really sit in the park and when it's cold. And maybe, you, you know, you can think of some kind of solution. So of, of the shoulder seasons, when maybe we'll take some of the seating away, there will be some other places for people to, to sit and enjoy the park. I personally never go in the park because I have a dog and I'm not allowed to go in the park. So I just really want it to be attractive as I walk by the park. And I think the, the idea of changing the, uh, the planting beds is, is pretty, I, I can't, it's hard for me to visualize that. It would be nice if you had some kind of, some kind of drawing. If you, if you take away those brick planters, what exactly is in the place of it. Um, certainly, certainly appreciate the inventory that you're going to take to make sure that mm -hmm. you're going to replace anything that gets lost during construction. Yeah, just so you know, the, the, it would, the, removing those brick planters would just be an extension of what you have. So essentially it's a combination of, you know, some woody plants like um, uh, Aaron mentioned the hydrangea, but also some perennials. Um, so it, right now, as you know, it, they're just at that height if you're a little kid. They must seem like a building, but if you're uh, a short adult, they they seem they're probably a visual barrier. If you're a tall adult, you're still you know, hitting it at stomach level, so they're they're pretty tall. Um, so that's the intent. Um, in regards to the trees, we just showed three examples. Just as Aaron said, they're they're very light, open trees. The the hydrangeas seem to be a fully version a full version, but but the but the red bud and matter of fact, if you want to see what kind of visual barrier is. That yellow witch hazel is at the corner of Appleton Street and Dartmouth Street. And um, that was actually in late February. I took that picture in the, with it in yellow bloom. So it's, it's pretty spectacular. And there would be not be much happening um, besides those blossoms. Um, and the, the red bud tree, as, um, that's at, uh, it's at Boston Latin. Um, so if you want to take a drive over there, you get to see what that looks like. Those trees don't really create much sort of um, blockage in regards to viewing. Uh, it's hard, um, and you'd have to go see the tree in person to really feel that. But but the intent would be that if you think spatial containment is a value valued point, then um, the tree um, could be part of the process 
to help alleviate that issue. Um, and, we, and we would select the one that was most appropriate that would not uh, compromise the safety of the park um, by not allowing eyes to get into it. Um, so that would be our goal. And we actually run across this all the time. So I just want to ease your fears on that one. And by the way, I, I have a perennial got at my house, some with more sun, some with less sun. So uh, you could still get a great garden with a few light canopy trees in it. <laughs> my one I thought about enlarging the entrances, though, is that when children are in the park playing, I don't want them to easily be able to run out onto Charles Street South. So I don't know how you deal with that. Well, option three would deal with it. <laughs> And Jim, you've shown um, ornamental gates at the entrances, mm -hmm. is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the Brown Fund um, um, funded the gates at Ringgold Park, for instance, uh, and also at um, Bradford Street Park. Um, it's in a way, it's up to the parent to close the gate once they go in, um, but they're operable gates and uh, they could be um, closed when you're in there and uh, keep an eye on things. Um, as you probably imagine, all the parks in the South End are frequented by children. Um, in regards to function in terms of entering at corners, I would recommend going to um, Hayes Park on Warren Avenue. Um, that has two angled walkways, both with the focal point being on um, the playing child in the middle of the tulip bed and in the background. And, and there's actually a third entry. Um, there's actually three entries into that park. Uh, there's a very small piece of play equipment in that park. Um, it's impeccably maintained by the neighborhood. And, um, and because it has a small play structure in there, there's a lot of children in there. And my daughter played there a lot um, growing up. And, um, and, and she, precocious child, we always had to keep an eye on her from running in, running out of the park. So um, that's just part of the process. <laughs> um, I can read some more comments um, that have come in in the chat. Um, Thank you. Aoife says that she loves the options and is interested in the third option, but may need to try them out. Ben says, will the perennials be kept during construction replanted um, when we inventory and we would have the contractor um, preserve and protect the existing perennials. So the ones that we are keeping would stay either off site somewhere safe or if there are parts that are not being disturbed. Well, let me add to that, Aaron, um, just full disclosure, construction is a messy business and these are perennials, so they're delicate plants. And one of the purposes for us inventorying every single plant that's there is that in reality it's likely that they would have to be replaced i mean it's hard to winter over or or heal in a perennial someplace um, it's possible but that would be a negotiation with the contractor and it might be just as easy to say um, we have these terrific perennials and and it would take um, 10 of them to replace them in kind um, and we would, the reason for going through the inventory, um, you or anyone who, who cares for the garden might say, well, one thing we don't want is that plant back in here. <laughs> so so it, it, that also will be a process, but I didn't want uh, you to get the impression that we're, um, we're going through a process of finding a little safe spot for every little perennial and, uh, and we're gonna bring that plant exactly and put it back in the exact same spot. That would be a process we would work through with you people, promise. Go ahead, Aaron. Yep, um, let's see. Um, Aoife is saying maybe walk through the concepts with some of her neighbors to gather some ideas. Um, do we have, and she's wondering if we have more designs for the possible fountain options or how the, for, current fountain would be um, moderated? Well, you know, the, the current fountain, from what we understand, the mechanics of it, it's functioning right now, but the mechanics of it are, are a bit of a disaster. They, it basically, what's below the fountain has to be rebuilt. So um, you know, that's a part of, that would be part of the investigation. Like, what do we have to do? Uh, we're 
where we understand that you love that fountain. So the, the intent would be to preserve it and restore it, um, but then to add to it. And the Ringgold Park fountain, as you saw, had a, had a bowl and, and water comes out of the top, but also uh, an interactive piece comes out of the side. Uh, we can't do that with your fountain. You have water coming out of the side and maybe that's the interactive portion. But the reason we showed the Bay, the Bradford Street Park is that also has a fountain on, the, on a, a backdrop. So, so it'd be doing what it's doing. But in front of it, there's like, it looks like a drainage grate. Actually, it is a drainage grate. But if you push a button off to the side, the, a spray comes out of the ground. And, and it, that's the interactive part. So uh, if you don't mind your child getting wet or playing a trick on your neighbor, um, yeah, that's an option. That's why we showed sort of a, a larger apron around a blue dot, the blue dot representing the restored and preserved garden of, of, of that uh, fountain that you have out there, but also adding a, a second component of some scale and that's to be developed. So that was the intent of those gestures. And I should go back to the plants just for a second, because one advantage of new replacement plants is that um, if they fail, they're under guarantee. Absolutely. And the contractor has to replace them at his expense. Whereas if they're replanted that were existing on site um, at the beginning of the project's construction, we have no easy way to get the contractor to replace those. You know, and one thing, uh, at what, if it would be helpful, uh, maybe it'd be helpful to go back a few slides and as we answer these, speak to these questions to have the four concepts up page up there to, at the same time. There we go. One too many. Yeah. There we go. So, all right. So why don't you go back to the chat question, um, comments. Okay. Um, the person whose name is Andrew, who I forgot whose name it actually is, John. Um, <laughs> says that um, says that we need places to sit with, um, and the Isabella Street Park is a good model for deterring homeless mm -hmm. hangout. Yep. So I'm, I'm making a note of that, that we will look into what they're using for seating. Let's see. Ben says he likes the entrance access via Fayette and Melrose in the corners of Concept 3. Aoife says during COVID, we all needed seating even during the off season. And I like a bench incorporated into the entrance area where people can meet and gather outside or around the entrance. Carol says there are already anchor trees in the corners, albeit small ones, Lilac and Rose of Sharon. So we'll make a note of that as, as we do the tree inventory. Um, Judy says Rutland Street Park has some big, nice granite blocks for seating. So maybe another option for seating. Mm -hmm. It would be. Um, Andrew says he likes option three because it increased safety for children. We do need the gates to be able to close the park at night. For the brick planter, I think the herring, for the big brick pattern, I think the herringbone gives a better non-slip surface than the running bond that currently is there. Um, Aoife says, um, can some of the plants be moved to other, I think plants, um, she may clarify, can some be moved to other parks like the Isabella one? We are okay with replacing it, it is not easy to fix. I, I'm assuming that's plants, it could be fountain. Um, Tom says he appreciates the concepts and if effort around the more radical option four, but he shares Judy's concern that the current church is underutilized and maybe a candidate for some sort of development proposal. Mm -hmm. It is attractive to extend the park visually on that side, but it would be a shame if the main entrance was blocked for construction not long after completion. Mm. Good point. Good point. Um, Carol says, children love playing in the water, but I don't think the focus of this fountain needs to be interactive, such as the ones at Bradford and Ringgold, both of which my children use to cool off. The garden fountain can be enjoyed by all as visual and an oral treat. Um, and that is all we have currently for comments. I was scrambling writing down all those uh, chats. So uh, I'm not sure if I can get every, um, a printout of those, Annie, but 
I think they're all great comments. I think I got them all. Yeah, I think this is really helpful. I'll send them to you, Jim. Oh, thank you. Appreciate and that, Christine. It, no, it seems like there's a clear preference for option three or concept three. Um, I'm not hearing a lot of support for keeping the brick planters. Is that correct? And yeah, I, I find the planters problematic because I'm short and I can't imagine trying to maintain um, plants inside of something that would demand a short person to reach pretty high. And the rats really put me off. <laughs> They're smart creatures though. <laughs> yeah, they are. And I, I totally agree about the, um, about the risk of incorporating some of the um, former Broadway into the park. What are some of the activities that people see happening in here for special events besides maybe hol a holiday tree or holiday lighting? I can just say the way it's been used often, people have held kind of informal little birthday get togethers um, in the park. Um, we've talked at various points, we've been held up by COVID, but we've talked about having, you know, tiny bit of chamber music. Um, you know, this is a pretty small park, so I don't think we're gonna do any huge events, but you know, you could have a, a small gathering for something like that. Tom, what's the street noise like? Um say it's seven in the evening? Not that bad. Um, okay. You know, the reality is that Charles Street South is, you know, thanks to the, the doings of the BRA years ago, um, far, far wider than it should be. It sure um, is. So the, you know, you know, the bad news is it could be a little bit of a racetrack. The good news is that, you know, traffic doesn't back up there. Um, you know, that street could be half as wide as it is and uh, it would accommodate the traffic on that end of it. You know, it doesn't bottle up until over by the garage and where the bike lanes have been installed. Well, will, I'm sorry. No, I that will, I was, that was I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I will say that um, at the drop-in sort of open house on site, there was a fair amount of discussion about um, crossing Charles Street mm -hmm. South at Fayette and there was some real concern that because of the curvature of the road, that the sight lines are poor there. But also I know that um, as I'm going back to the South End and getting onto Tremont Street, and maybe it's um, Arlington, there's a pedestrian crossing that incorporates flashing lights that seems to, um, really work pretty well. Yeah, I, I would agree and advocate for that. I think I might mm -hmm. need it. Yeah, it's taken, took us years and years to get that put in. That was a neighborhood <laughs> that some people really busted their pick on for, for many, many years. Uh, yeah. I would say it's of mixed success, uh, honestly. Some folks still ignore it, but it's better than it was. Yeah. I, I would advocate that for Charles Street. I think it's needed because I, I, I agree. You know, many people get clipped and, and really a lot of people um, you can't see around that curve and mm -hmm. a lot of people get caught in the middle of the street and some people just don't even stop at all for pedestrians. So I, I think it would help to have a have a pedestrian walkway right there because yeah. I, I know my child is uh, numerous times when she was a toddler, we almost got clipped. Um, on that on that portion, so I think that, that would be really beneficial from a safety as well as assisting for the uh, the dog park. Yeah, it's um, I, I love Tom's comment about you know the the street is much wider than it needs to be, and um, you know there's there are of, of course this isn't this isn't Boston Parks it's it's a different group of people, but to uh, maybe Annie you could put a word in, but certainly ha having that road be on some sort of diet and uh, having 
the sidewalk bump out at a key point. So instead of like being up against the building before you run across the street, you're out on a safe zone um, further out and the street gets a bit narrower. And uh, I mean, there's, there's ways of controlling traffic and calming traffic, even on a corner. Um, but unfortunately that's not part of the park design. Um, but it, I absolutely concur that when you have two parks so close in proximity to one another, it, it's, uh, it's a community problem that should be looked at. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> probably not within Annie's budget, but, um, but certainly maybe you could put a reward into traffic or something like that and, and have that could start the conversation. Tom and Ben, what agency were you working with when you got the Isabella Street crossing? So Nancy spearheaded that effort. I know a bunch of it was with uh, Public Works. Mm -hmm. I'll see. I'll see what I can find out. Yeah, that took uh, many years to kind of get on the list, and then it took uh, almost it seemed like a full year to execute. Yeah, um, but it is certainly helpful versus the the prior state. Arlington is a different condition because there the sight lines are. Uh, better, but it's jam packed with traffic and they've changed the timing of the lights with the installation of the bike lane. So now it bottles up quite a bit and that can be quite a bit noisier. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be South. surprised if South Charles Street is already on their radar in some capacity because there is not a bike lane on Charles Street if you haven't noticed. And, um, you know, being someone who is, you know, hasn't driven to work for 37 years, but but has biked to work, um, you know, I recognize where all the bike lanes are and it's conspicuously as absent in that area. So I wouldn't be surprised if people are already discussing it, thinking about it in regards to bikes. So it's a fairly short walk from bike to crossing. Um, um, we, we, almost every one of our projects in the city deal with that. So uh, it, it would be worth a phone call if nothing else to get the conversation started. Makes sense. We have a couple more comments. We have four votes for the removal of the planters. Um, other, other activities that people have seen at the park are kids' birthday parties are frequent. Um, Andrew says, Aoife says that extended evening seating and gathering is needed, especially during the summer months. Andrew says wedding photos are often are been taken at the park. Um, regarding the crossing of Charles Charles, Aoife says it's not as loud as Arlington or Isabella due to traffic backups and honking. And the Isabella Street crossing has been great um, as <laughs> we discussed. And Nancy M was the person who spirited that effort. Um, Andrew wonders if a pedestrian flashing light can be funding through this project. That's John. Uh, oh, John. Sorry. Um, don't. That would be Annie. I. I think we just discussed. We don't think it can be the pedestrian flashing. Yeah, I would be really surprised um, if we could move capital funds from one department to another department. We would have but, to work with BTD to get that yeah. funded. And then the last comment, Marie says that um, planters can also go. So it's five votes for planters. Hmm. Well, personally, I'm glad the majority of the people seem to be leaning toward concept three because um, I personally, being someone who's had many friends live in, in Bay Village and uh, actually actually worked on Isabella Street from, uh, oh, for eight years <laughs> and at uh, an architect's office right behind the fire station. Um, it's, it's, you know, going to parties here and coming out of Bay Village and feeling like, where is Bay Village and how does the park connect with Bay Village? I think 
it's kind of what this is all about. It's a little bit of an urban design problem and, uh, and how, how can this park feel like it's being, being embraced by Bay Village and a little less by South Charles Street. So, um, you know, creating that nice, soft, friendly edge to South Charles, but doing it with planting and not necessarily with gates or, or nice materials. It's, it's sort of giving it the edge that it should have and, and then Bay Village edge that it should have. So uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad people are leaning that way. And Carol was asking if we could take another look at concept three. And just keep in mind, you know, that one gate could be larger than the other. I mean, that's all part of the design process. This is really just the concept to really begin to form the space and, and, and the function. So, so, and we were happy to be showing four benches, but there could be three benches and, and some could go out um, at the, right at the entrance of the park. A, a subtle change here, we actually, as a result of putting the entrances in the corners, moved um, two of the light poles. All the light poles will be dismantled, rebuilt and put back, but they'll be put back where we think they have seen best. This is actually putting a, a light pole. If, if you, it's a little hard to see, but right at the end, outside the gates. So it's like a little bit of a post um, having a historic light there. So it's a, it's a slight detail that uh, we'd love to get involved with. And, uh, and you know, during the, the, the real design process, once, once a, uh, an option is selected, that every detail, this will be a park where the details matter. It's too small to be, um, you know, the spatial impact that a public garden or Boston Common will have. So this will be all about the details. You're gonna see every little tiny piece. I think those little moves will, will really make it sing. Jim, you know, I can't remember if irrigation was part of the scope. Well, I mean, that's did this it originally no. Um, I think someone may have asked that in, in that sort of forty-page letter, um, forty pages of letters I read. I think someone may have a, a mentioned irrigation. Um, so that it's not a big park, so I don't think that would be a problem putting that in there as long as the city would, doesn't mind metering it and uh, and. Um, having it function that way. I don't, I don't know how, how Boston Parks feels about irrigating parks just in general, but I think it'd be a great idea. If nothing else, having a functional hose bibs out there. So uh, it's easy to water the, the park. I, I saw the hose out there. Um, so there must be a hose bib someplace. I don't know if you're running it from the church. Carol, where were where do you get water? Um, there is a um, a metal box that has the water in it, and it needs to have somebody from the city come out and turn it on in the spring and turn it uh -huh. off. In the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now, the spigot for it is just on the edge of the box, yeah. so I don't. Um, yeah, so you can just attach a hose and do it. But I I was thinking more if there could be something like. Maybe we even purchase soaker hoses or something because when it's hot, the garden doesn't do very well. When it rains like this summer, we're, we're great. And that's how Ringgold Park functions as well. There's um, this, this city comes out, you know, whenever they come out in mid-April or so and turns on the water. It's always a fight saying, you know, on a hot spring, you can come out earlier. Um, but once it's on, there's a spigot out there inside the box you can attach the hose to. Couple more comments. Um, Aoife says the middle box, the current one that we were just talking about is rusting and was part of the original request to replace. We would be replacing that as part of the project. Absolutely. We probably look at a little bit better materials so it's easier to maintain as well.
the Ringgold Park one, by the way, is rusting as well. And um, so we can address that. If I'd like to go back to you for a second, um, what were you imagining for quote unquote, trying out the different concepts, um, maybe with some neighbors on site? Oh, I was thinking I might, uh, sorry, I didn't clarify that because I can't type that fast. Um, <laughs> what I was thinking was, I liked all of them, but you know, it's hard for, and most of us, I think, to look at these drawings and understand all of the elements that they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Might be nice. I might print up some of these and just walk around the garden with a few neighbors and sort of say, "Oh, well, that's what that is. Oh, there's the tree. That's what that means." And you know, I love. I mean, now having pointed out the lights, the lights outside, I, I really like that idea because I think it could be very beautiful. And you know, the layout it could be more visually appealing mm -hmm. from these options the way you put them together. And it isn't really nice to sort of stand in the park and see them ourselves and um but i think this is fun I, I really like a lot of these i think this is very smooth and simple but also you know like you said every detail will matter in such a small space but i think you've thought of a lot of it so you know i'm sure as we move through the process we'll work out the final details but it seems lovely to me i think but it might be nice just you learn a lot by standing there with a the drawing going oh that's what i'm seeing yeah i'd be happy i'd be happy to facilitate that Great. okay well maybe over the next few weeks or so whenever works you know would be really great to do yeah. yeah i would suggest too i mean there's a little bit of pirating from all the other parks brought into this park um all those parks that we show as the precedent um they all function beautifully in their own way and um, it's subtle. I mean, many times we, we like something and don't know why. Yeah. And so I think taking you know, the, these options, standing in this park um, is a great idea, um, but then taking them and walk to the other parks. I mean, they're all within a half a mile of here yeah. and, uh, and take a look at saying, oh yeah, this one enters on the corner. And oh yeah, that focal point on, on that Cahil uh, Gabran sculpture over there is pretty sweet. I wonder if we can get a sculpture in our park. There's those types of things. That's what I'm, and we have walked with quite a few neighbors. We have walked to other parks and it mm -hmm. really does make you realize how spatially important they are as you go through them, what you're sitting on, why you're sitting on it and what are you looking at? And I think that's something we forget about in this park. We're not always, we've, we've, we're so used to it. We're not noticing that we're sometimes looking at less than aesthetic things. Mm -hmm. Traffic flowing by, you know, there's nicer ways. We can maybe draw our attention in different ways with this. So, no, I'd be very happy to um, coordinate that. And just for myself, I, I would find that very, very helpful. Okay. Oh, I, I read plans for a living. Yeah. So I'd be glad to contribute that. I should make one schedule note. And that is that starting Monday, I begin a three week um, term of federal jury duty service. And it's unlikely that I'll be called to come in every day. Yeah. Um, but right now I cannot predict what my schedule is gonna be like. So yeah. I should, I should also say that um, mm -hmm. I won't be able to, when I do have to show up, I won't be able to look at emails during the day, but I'll be checking them in the evening. You're not allowed to take any kind of electronic device into the courtroom. I'm going to feel naked. <laughs> it'll be, well, hopefully it'll be a pleasant experience for you, not too hard. <laughs> But I'm fairly flexible and maybe some evenings after work or, you know, if you're off, let me okay. know. Oh, maybe we can coordinate something for that. That would be great. Okay. Sounds great. But I think this is fantastic. So I'm very happy with how this, this looks. Thank you. Well, we appreciate your kind comments and I want to thank 
um, Jim and Aaron for doing such a great job and responding quickly to our comments and um, bringing a lot of good thought into this. So I think that we're in a good place. And I also wanna thank Christine for shepherding us through this meeting this evening. Thank you, Christine. Uh, no problem. And I assume you all know how to get in touch with me. So um, you know where to find me and any comments you give me, I, I can pass on to um, Copley Wolf. Excellent. Is there anything particular you need us as a neighborhood to do between now and the next round? Is well, one, one thing that's critical, I mean, it seems that most people are leaning toward option three, but certainly as people digest them, um, they may be common. I mean, our next step, as Annie mentioned, the date has not been set up yet, is to come back with um, the one option, which may be a combination of things. So somehow getting those comments to her are critical for us to produce something that you, know, you, you guys find palatable uh, as sort of a a final option going forward. And it's, you know, and, you know, just to assuage your, your fears <laughs> with that comment, uh, it's not that um, we come back with one option and you, and you think, um, I, I'm stuck with this car. Um, <laughs> uh, there will then be a design process beyond that too. So there will be opportunity to, to massage things. But, it, but if there's some big things you've discovered between now and, and that next meeting, to get those comments to her are critical. Okay. And I do have a question that Carol might have the answer to. Um, does anybody know if there's a list of the plants that have been planted, especially the perennials? You know what, last year I went around and drew my own terrible version of landscape um, design and wrote down what plants were where. So I'm happy to share, uh, maybe redo that and share it. <laughs> Since and then, Tom has added a couple other things, I have no idea if the hydrangea that are there are perennial or not. He put they're, they're, they're woody. Not. Yeah, they're woody year-round plants. They're, they're year-round, but they will they come back? Oh, yeah. Okay. Anyway, those are the only things that are new. Um, but I'm happy to share that. That would be great. And the woody plants are a plant that possibly could be um, moved, but um, as long as at the city and you guys are willing to roll the dice, and as Annie mentioned, they won't be guaranteed. The, uh, new plants are always warranted. Um, moved plants are not. So that's the, the chance you take with those. So um, part of what I was thinking about is that if they if we're taking up the garden, that I might move them to another one, but not return them to them. Yes, so, that's a good deal. <laughs> and in the garbage, that they might be moved with care and reserve, you know, they have a second chance. They may or may not make it in their new home, but you know, it's a shame to throw away perfectly good plants if they might survive somewhere else. It doesn't mean they have to come back to that park. And I mentioned to Annie that um, you know, before a, a shovel is put into the ground, um, I've got a terrific plant ID app on my phone. And uh, uh, in combination with whatever Carol would give us, um, I would personally identify every plant myself and also inventory that as a pre-existing condition prior to um, disturbing anything. Um, as I mentioned, uh, if whoever's taking care of the garden is anything like me, you get sick of looking at a plant and <laughs> it's no longer welcome in the garden and you, you might have a few of those in this one, so. <laughs> yeah, it's been many people's work on top of each other. <laughs> Some of those things don't look so good anymore. <laughs> Jim, does your app also identify invasives? It, it does. I was identifying the invasives in Ringgold Park. And um, unbelievable, when I went back to take a picture of the gate that was in this presentation, because I didn't have a good clean shot of it, I went into the park 
And remarkably, somebody had already weeded the entire middle part of the park and every one of those invasives were gone. <laughs> I didn't see any invasives, by the way, in this one here, but uh, but I didn't look that closely. <laughs> Ringo Park, there was there was a it was a it was out of control, but it was within control within five days of uh, me identifying the invasives. There's some nasty bindweed in there, but uh, uh, with a lot of digging last year, it seems to have gotten it somewhat under control. <laughs> Yeah, Carol, if you need any help with that, putting that together, I would really be happy to join with you and help identify, get a list together, whatever. That sounds great, Eva. I'd love to do that. It sounds fun. And anybody else who wants to join in? <laughs> well, I'm going to end this the same way that I started it, which is to thank you all so much for giving us your time and um, thoughtful insights this evening. This, you know, we've had two earlier meetings that were extremely helpful. Tonight was extremely helpful. So, um, you know, this is the kind of neighborhood involvement that makes a huge difference. You are very lucky, it's a good neighborhood. Thank you. Yep. Well, I want to thank everyone as well. I mean, Bay Village is always, I you know, say I've lived in the South End, just, you know, around the corner for 37 years. And, uh, you know, my daughter went to went to sixth grade uh, on Church Street. If you guys remember, that building was the Josiah Quincy School for for a couple of years, the sixth grade, before they, they took over the Lincoln School in the corner of Arlington and um, in Fayette. And... Um, and, you know, as I've had friends who lived in the neighborhood and it's, it's always been a neighborhood that I, that I've really loved and um, get a good, great sandwich in. <laughs> I think are we, should we call a halt?